Um, hey. Hi, how are you doing? Hello, and then how are you? I am good, thank you. And just Luciana and Victoria, just to turn your mic off as well as your your camera when you get a chance. That's all right. Hey, um, hey Martika, how are you doing? What's your score today? My score is seven. Seven, yeah, we'll take a seven. And um, I know you've got a busy day, so we've got to finish sort of bang on the the, the thirty minutes. So um, really good to see you. And we, um, we we've done a couple of these now. And uh, and I guess you know our, our panel session is mental health perspectives for the BAME community. Um, yeah. And we're going to really get into that. Obviously, a very topical uh, thing to be discussing with the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, mm -hmm. But you, uh, you're the founder of Benevolent Health. Tell us a little bit about your background, uh, Martika, and, and what Benevolent Health is all about, please. So I am, as, as you said, I'm the founder of Benevolent Health. I support um, individuals and teams around um, well-being through coaching and mentoring. And I'm particularly interested in the diverse perspective and bringing diversity to the table um, around mental health. Not one size fits all. And we do need to have, you know, a broad spectrum of different things that we can offer people. Yeah, absolutely. And look, it's a big topic, as you you, you said when we uh, sort of had our, our pre-discussion on this. And 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 I'll, I'll read it out. Ultimately, you would like to promote togetherness and inclusivity, while discouraging polarization between black versus white. And and you know, I think you know many of us that would be a, that would be a goal as well. But I think it, we often struggle um, to to sort of find the language and find the right things to say. And that shouldn't stop us from trying to get into it, should it? And 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 actually move it forward. Exactly. I mean, I think I think some of the challenge around this is we don't want to hurt people's yeah. feelings. And, you know, I think that, you know, sometimes when we talk about difficult things, there there is a bit of that. But, I, you know, I think that, that that's kind of part of kind of fumbling around with new stuff is that, you know, you get it wrong and you need to kind of apologise or change the way you do it. And, you know, that's how we learn. So I, I guess there's an opportunity for some real honest discussion um, on this at the moment, because I think that, um, you know, people people are up for kind of fumbling around in the dark a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a kind of nice way of putting it actually um, you know let's let's try and make it a little bit lighter and, and let's get let's all get on the journey so look let's get into it so the the history of mental health so clearly there are some stats that are pretty worrying why are BAME communities more affected and then particularly so during during COVID so um I mean obviously mental health I think that um often we think about mental health as in mental illness so there's still quite a lot of stigma around mental health as, as it is without um, adding kind of complexities onto it. Um, and then when we start adding BAME onto um, the mental health conversation, I mean, if you look at the stats for schizophrenia, for example, people from black and Asian backgrounds are much more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia if they, approach, if they go into treatment in a crisis. So, you know, also with um, black men, for example, they're four times more likely to be sectioned under the Mental Health Act. And then if we look at um, prisons, for example, um, we have a large male population in prison with mental health issues and um, over-representation from um, black and ethnic minorities. So in terms of kind of the stats, if you like, it, it's quite stacked up against uh, black and ethnic minorities. I mean, in terms of, um, if you kind of compare it to white counterparts, 20% um, more BAME communities um, will be susceptible to um, depression, to anxiety and to um, mental health issues compared to their white counterparts. So we have uh, a, a higher prevalence um, with probably slightly more stigma and systemic issues. And then, you know, when you're looking at the kind of the treatment um, process, if you kind of start on the preventative end, which would be your kind of IAP services or your GP, we only see 36% of men um, turning up for talking therapies. So, and, and in BAME communities, this is even less. However, the crisis end is, is swamped. So, so we have to kind of ask the question, you know, what, what's happening here? And, and if you add COVID on top of that, I think the challenge is with COVID, as we know, with key workers, we've got, you know, 20% um, more uh, BAME communities with, with COVID diagnosis. So 
um, it, it's all kind of stacking up here and, and not looking um, very, very positive. Yeah, and, and there's, there's, there's a lot in there. Um, why do you think, first of all, the kind of stats for the BAME community on, on incidences and, and sectioning and, and, and particular conditions are so much higher? Um, I, I think there's a, a, a few things, and I think that there are some complicated issues um, within that. I mean, I, I touched a little bit on um, COVID, and I think one of the challenges with COVID is that we've changed the, you know, the coronavirus bill has changed some of the laws around the Mental Health Act. So, for example, now um, you only have one um, doctor sign off on um, sections, which actually uh, starts to increase the possibility for vulnerable communities, um, you know, to, to have uh, incorrect diagnosis or for people to be sectioned when perhaps they shouldn't be. So I, I think that, you know, COVID kind of, um, I guess, puts a, a pressure already um, in the community that 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 is that is struggling or that is having challenges with um, with the mental health system. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and look, let's let's look at the kind of explore the belonging a little bit more. Um, and and the, the, I guess the psychological impact of discrimination or perceived discrimination for, for the BAME communities. What's your, what's your perspective on that, Martika? So, um, I mean, there's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because the, the Black Lives Movement has really kind of, um, I, I feel a real kind of togetherness in terms of, you know, the social movement around um, around uh, this, this issue. People are starting to talk more and um, have, have a say around it. And, and many people are coming out, not just, um, it's not just a, a black thing. There's lots of, uh, all different nations are kind of standing together in solidarity on that. And it's really heartwarming actually yeah. to see um, you know the level of participation um, in in that in that topic, and I think um, you know within that it, you, you can really sense the belonging and the value that that's happening um, there. But I also I also guess there's a an opportunity to kind of um, start splitting and um, blaming, and um, I, I've seen a lot of videos with um, white people, for example, apologising for um, white privilege. Um, I've seen um, statues being torn down, and um, you know things that we um, associate with with white privilege uh, being destroyed. And, and you know perhaps not that's not a very helpful way of um, expressing uh, this. And there's a lot of anger, and I think there's a lot of um, disconnection from or feeling feeling belong, feeling like you belong, feeling valued. Yeah. So. I think that's a, a kind of a real um, challenge that this is brought up in terms of, of how people are feeling. And, and I think it's very different kind of depending on, you know, where you sit within that in terms of your own um, experience and, and, and lifestyle. But I, I think there is like real opportunity um, with this, uh, with Black Lives Matter to um, to bring around some really positive change. I've definitely seen, you know, some really good um, things happening in organisations around, um, you know, really bringing um, some diverse, diversity into the, into the organisation. And um, we've seen some conversations that we wouldn't have had before that are coming onto the table that are really helpful. So there, there's real opportunity to, to take uh, action and um, a positive anti-racist action as opposed to um, what I would call in psychological terms um, splitting and projecting all the bad onto uh, one group of people. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, we've got some questions coming through already and it doesn't surprise me. This is, you know, this is an emotive issue for people. And um, I, I guess the two questions are fairly linked there. So for, from, from Al, what needs to change in the current narrative of thought and recovery within BAME communities? Do you have a view on that one? Say that question again. Sorry. So, what what needs to change the current narrative of thought and recovery within BAME communities? I mean, I, I think when we're speaking about recovery, I think that the the for me, the mental health system has been very um, all of the treatments, if you like, are very skewed towards illness. Yeah. 
and you know the 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 illness model and you know you need medication you need a professional and i'm not saying there's not a place for that i I absolutely think there is i'm a psychotherapist by background and so my training is you know clinical however i do think there is a real opportunity particularly in the preventive space preventative space can't speak and also you know within the workplace to um have these conversations around stress around anxiety around depression the lower level um what i would call mental wellness or mental fitness conversation that are much more inclusive i think there are certainly in um in my community there's a lot of stigma around mental health still and you know if you um speak about um having mental health issues it is a a kind of the schizophrenia um you know um and um personality disorder you know the higher end of 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 the spectrum so i think there's a lot of work to be done within our own community but also i think there's a real opportunity to make the narrative more inclusive Um, you know what do we see when we look at pictures of people with mental health issues i mean if you google it now you'll see all of these terrible pictures of people in asylums with pills and you know really scary And, and the reality is you know we're talking about having good sleep eating the right food fitness you know your emotional resilience it's all of these conversations that we need to make more um, accessible yeah. and how we present those as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the whole prevention, even the word prevention, I don't like because you know, prevention implies we're preventing illness, um, which is true. And I know it's the commonly a- accepted term, but I, I like to term it promoting positive health because it's a different way of looking at it. So can we do all of the things to promote positive mental well-being? And I think yeah, this 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 is a societal issue, right? But, that we're not we're not educated and trained how to look after our mental well being. Um, we are trained to kind of brush our teeth um, and you know look after our physical fitness more recently and eat less sugar, but we're not really educated on on managing our mental well being, and that's the mental fitness term that you use there. So I think there's definitely some stuff that we can be doing in the workplace and in society to help educate people on how to do that and why is social connection important and why is sleep important um but what what specifically do you think we can do in the BAME communities to to help with that process around prevention promotion yeah i mean i think prevention needs to be taken out of what i would call the traditional model so out of kind of um you know mental health services per se or gp practices or you know places where it's associated with being unwell um, and and really integrate it into into communities into kind of everyday things yeah. that we do um you know whether that's going to the gym or you know where we um eat out or um you know local festivals however that looks i, I think it needs to be much more involved in in the communities that we're, we're trying to reach much more embedded yeah absolutely and and do you see the black lives matter movement improving the mental health agenda do you see do you, i mean it's obviously got a lot of goals to and a lot of change that we need to make but mental health specifically do you see an improvement as a result and um, i think the the idea i mean we touched on it a little bit earlier around belonging and mm-hmm. feeling valued and i think that the the black lives matter movement has definitely raised the bar in terms of you know bringing awareness and i think people are feeling more um supported more listened to which which adds to the feeling of of being valued being heard being understood and um, but as in practical implementations I, I think that it's going to be interesting to see where this goes and, you know, what actually changes, because I think, you know, often with kind of um, big public movements is that they, you know, they attract a lot of attention um, and then when they die down, um, you know, stuff's not followed up. So we really need to, you know, go into action with this yeah. and, and and make stuff happen. So, for example, um, I was thinking today about sort of um, cultural, um, you know, raising cultural awareness within within services, within our workforce and within our organisations and what that looks like and understanding different people's values and beliefs and, you know, how um, people connect, what their cultural relevance of stuff is. Yeah. And I 
thinking about actually how, you know, where is that embedded? Where is that in organisations or where is that in the NHS? Where is that, you know, within treatment? Because as a, as a therapist uh, giving treatment, I think, where is that in my practice? Um, so, so really, you know, how do we translate this into action? Because that's key. I think for Black Lives Matter. Absolutely, and 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 you're right. There's there's a great amount of momentum, you know, and there's also a great amount of momentum coming out of COVID generally on the mental health agenda. And the same applies. We need to harness that. Mm. So how how do we turn that into action? Um, and it was interesting in 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 a number of the discussions earlier that we were hearing about actually there is this level of connectivity and connectedness that is is rising in the nhs in certain areas that as a result of the challenges that that we're being faced now one would hope and, and i'm always an optimist martika i always have a positive view of the world but one one would hope that in the bame communities as well we start to see um that that level of of connectedness again on the well-being and mental health agenda rise as a result um, but we do need to tap into it don't we absolutely and we need to have more trained um mentors therapists psychiatrists nurses you know all of these these roles and um, we need to be promoting them to bane communities because we need a workforce that's representative as well yeah. um, so i think that goes a long way in breaking down and barriers and stigma and, and changing the way we do things so yeah and would you you know again going off piste a little bit but i, I heard um is someone someone say this at a different function last week and do you think we have enough um diversity in in the kind of therapy um community so um again is, is the, the typical view of a therapist maybe you know white um and and again making the BAME community feel more comfortable speaking to people that look like them about issues that are really important to them and heavily stigmatised. Do you think there's more work to be done there? Um, absolutely. I think we can have much more diversity within um, the workforce. Uh, and I think particularly with therapists. Um, when I trained, um, I remember the year, the year I, I, went to, I went to Birkbeck, which is Central London University, and that was like 2010. So, I mean, it, it was the first year, I remember the tutor saying, this is the first year we've had an even amount of men and women training. Yep. So, um, you know, it, it still was a very, you know, if you think how therapy is delivered, it, it's kind of a, uh, is a you, you know, you need to have a, a level of um, lifestyle to be able to, you know, work part time and to, um, you know, to, to spend that money training. It's not a, a cheap training. So. Yeah. I think it does attract certain types of people. I don't think that's necessarily um, about, you know, colour or class, but I think that, you know, you, you do have to, um, it is a bit, I guess, um, I don't know, elitish, snobbish maybe, yeah. I don't know. Um, and, and I think there's something about, you know, making it more accessible, the training, because, you know, you have to um, do the training, you have to do the placement, you have to pay for supervision. It's it's quite a, a lot of stuff. And if you don't have access to bursaries and all of those sorts of things, then, you know, how do you how do you make it happen? So yeah. I, I think there is something about thinking about how we train therapists and um, but also how we make this kind of job accessible to different types of people um, as opposed to. And, you know, probably someone that's a bit older, had a career and is looking to kind of um, retire or do something part time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I do, I'd agree with you on that. And then, yeah, that's the kind of therapy side. And we, 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 we've we spoke a bit today around kind of, you know, role modelling of healthy behaviours and role modelling that it's OK to speak out when you're struggling. How do you think that we, um, you know, we get more role models that can influence, uh, you know, diverse communities uh, on this issue? Um, for me, I'm really um, in on the um, mentoring uh, model and um, the idea of using people with lived experience. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, there's very, something very powerful in that approach. Um, if you look at kind of you know NA and um, those kinds of uh, those kinds of kind of uh, groups that actually there's a lot of value in that of, of connecting with like-minded people and so it's how do we 
how do we support and grow um, peer mentors or how do we support and, 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 and grow lived experience within the treatment model? Um, and, and I think there's really room for that in, in terms of, of bringing diversity into that. And, I, and I'm not just talking about like, the volunteering end. I think we really need to think about this as, as a service model. Because if you think with coronavirus, you know, we're predicting that in sort of six months time, probably less now, three to six months time, that, you know, we're going to have this huge spike of people with sort of PTSD and, you know, all kinds of uh, mental health issues. And how are we going to, you know, we don't have a workforce ready to, to manage this uh, this influx. So yeah. how, you know, how are we going to do it? And and, and so I, I think there's opportunity now for thought around, you know, how we get ready for this. And I think there's real opportunity to bring diversity into it, not just from Bain, but also, you know, in in, in age, age range as well and, and how we, we deliver things in a holistic way. Yeah, absolutely. And, and right at the top of the conference, Nor Sir Norman Lamb was talking about yeah, making this a community led approach and, and, and bringing the different perspectives along the journey. Um, I guess. So thinking, you know, you've got a crystal ball and you, uh, you, know, you, 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 know, you stargaze from a, a positive perspective. What, what is your hope, uh, Martika, as we travel through this? And um, again, guys, if you've got any questions in the audience, please do post them and we'll have time for one or two. But what is your hope as we, we travel out this, both, both generally on the mental health agenda and for the BAME community? Um, for, I hope for the, for, the, um, for the mental health agenda, I would hope that we really prioritise um, key workers in terms of um, treatment and support. I think that they've had a, a really tough time yeah. in the last few months. I, and I think that, um, you know, it, it, it should almost be mandatory to, you know, to have some support if, if wanted. Um, I think it should should be there for for them. So I would like to see that. Um, I would also like to see, um, like I said about the peer mentoring, that's close to my heart. I think we can add real value to the whole, you know, not to um, substitute but supplement, um, you know, proper psychological therapies. Because um, I think there's going to be a real access issue actually, yeah. and I think that's what we're heading towards. So I think that we need to try to keep as many people as well. Um, as possible and and for me that doesn't look like the same old same old we have to have diversity and difference in that so um, I'm, I'm really hoping to see this sector um, open out and I don't mean you know that we devalue psychological treatment I think we absolutely need to have that and we need to follow nice guidelines and it needs to be clinically sound um, but there is there is opportunity for the other end of the spectrum where it can be a lot more holistic and you know bring a lot more um, diversity and new things um, to the market. So I'm I'm hoping to see um, more access to you know going to my GP and I can um, you know get a prescription to have a massage or um, you know something like that. I mean like obviously I don't expect to. Um, have have that fully paid yeah. on, on the NHS, but you you know the options there that aren't just would you like to have some antidepressants and some talking therapy? I think that we have to go beyond that. Yeah, absolutely, and and yeah, getting into the the, the prevention promotion debate, you know, social prescribing, um, and and a lot of the things that that to keep me well and nothing to do with therapy um and my therapist is here watching as as we know so um that, that keeps me well too but it's it is it's getting out on my bike it's prioritizing sleep it's making sure to the best of my ability i'm connected with my, my friends and family and i'm allocating time and it's a balancing act but you know Again, I, I would love to get a get a massage right now. Um, that's one of the things that I miss most about, about lockdown. Um, but it, it it is that's a holistic approach as you say, isn't it? Absolutely. I think I think like you said, you know, everything everyone connects to this differently and everyone, you know, has their own well-being routine or I think we should be encouraging people to have their own routine and understand what self-care is because you know, I think that I, I was listening to the conversation before, particularly around key workers, that, you know, self-care is seen as a luxury or something that we, you know, an indulgence. We're actually, it, it, it keeps us well. You know, we should we should be promoting this as much as we do brushing our teeth. It, yeah. it should be part of what we do. So, 
yeah, I, th I think there's real opportunity. And the other thing I would say as well, it, you know, inside ourselves, I think, um, you know, to build your own self-awareness and your own capacity to um, understand and know more about yourself. I think it's really easy to, you know, project all the bad things, all the aggression, all the difficult things that we have inside of us onto yeah. other people, onto other cultures, races, and, and think it's something out there. When actually, you know, if we own, you know, some of our bad parts and understand our own difficulties, then, you know, it, it actually makes us, it make, it makes us easier to connect with. It makes us, it makes it easier to, um, you know, to show up and, and be value in the communities that we're in, in our sphere of, of influence. So I think there's something also in, in self-awareness and how we treat other people and how we treat our colleagues, our family, our friends, that really impacts um, well-being and it impacts belonging. Yeah. And that, that self-awareness, it's hard to come by, isn't it, sometimes? Because unless you've gone through a particular challenge, you might not have built up that self-awareness. So what would you say to the person who's got sort of moderate mental health, maybe, you know, not in a crisis, but, you know, you know a five out of 10 on my scale, a six out of 10 most of the time, you know, could, could be better, um, could be more towards thriving, but doesn't really have that self-awareness. How, how does that person start? I always encourage people to have um, uh, make space um, for, for I call it stress time. So you, you make space for your your thoughts and to really listen to kind of what's going on um, inside of you. Because I think that when you're able to listen to what's going on, um, you can digest things better. You can hear things differently. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's how how do you create that space? I mean, some people do it through running or you know riding their bikes sports how some people meditate some people pray you know everybody's got a different way of getting into that quiet time with themselves but I would really encourage that and encourage your you know you to listen to what's going on in your own heart because I think that you can often hear you know the things that you need to think about and prioritize and deal with um, and the things that you perhaps need to pause and you know get help with so yeah. If you're at a five, I would really encourage you to just spend some time with yourself listening. Not, it doesn't have to be that long; it could be five minutes a day, but just just to give yourself that time to to hear um, what what's going on. Yeah, I think that's beautiful, and and I I, I like to term it giving giving yourself the the gift of a, a moment to to notice what is driving your form, mm -hmm. and if we can do that, it, and you're right, it doesn't need to be. Uh, a huge amount of time we don't need to meditate for an hour and, and Victoria was talking about self-care being a minute a day to start with if we can do that that's that gets the ball rolling doesn't it and then it, it's it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy but it's starting with that gift of self-reflection to say hey what's driving what I'm feeling right now and how can I influence it absolutely I, I think that you know self-care is so um it's so personal isn't it in terms of how you um, relate and connect and also what space that you want to give yourself to have that um so uh and, and i and, and there's so much opportunity as well within that you know you're not dependent on a service or another person or some kind of treatment it really does come from you know within um but but saying that there is a place where you do need to you know go and get help from someone else because you know things are escalating and becoming um you know not manageable yeah fantastic so i promise to get you out on time you've got a client in about five minutes so i'm going to i'm going to let you go um but before i do that i'd just like to say thank you so much um for sharing your perspectives it, it was good to fumble through the conversation with you uh, martika which i would do any time and um um, you posted your LinkedIn there, so please do do connect with Martika. So thanks again. No, thank you. I've got some resources um, if you want some more resources on um, BAME communities and, and mental health. If you just connect with me on LinkedIn, I can um, signpost you to those on my um, page. Yeah, fantastic.